in our final session, our fifth and final session of this series, Head Coach. And in this series, we've been looking at how God is our ultimate head coach and how he is kind of calling us and directing us in every area of our lives. And we've also been examining, you know, some of the thoughts that we have and just comparing them with the truth of God's word. So I don't want to waste much time. I want to jump right into it. And we're going to uh, look at Romans 12.2. All the verses will be on the screen as well. So Romans 12.2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Let's pray. Jesus, we're so thankful that you haven't left us to do life alone. I pray that we would learn more about how you've designed us to live. Replace the lies we're believing with the truth. Holy Spirit, move in this place, and I pray that you would just speak through me in a clear and powerful way. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, how many people went shopping on Black Friday? A couple people, some people out there. Now, the real question is, how many people actually went shopping on Thanksgiving? Okay, not too many people. That's good. Um, but last year, I'm not much of a Black Friday shopper myself. I'm more of a Cyber Monday kind of guy. But um, last year, I ended up at Walmart on Thanksgiving because we needed a few last-minute things for our Thanksgiving meal. Um, we needed to buy a couple things. So I'm over at Walmart. But when I got there, I'm like, what the heck is going on? It didn't look like norm Walmart normally looks. I get in there. There's like all these employees running around. Um, every single cash register is open and staffed. There are police officers stationed everywhere. Certain sections of the place are like uh, taped off. And I asked the lady, I said to her, I'm like, you know, what's going on out here? And she's like, with the most look of like sheer panic on her face, she goes, we're preparing for the 6 p.m. Black Friday sale. And I'm like, oh, okay, so like, what's up with the police? Is that, is that really necessary? She's like, yes, it's really necessary. Last year, there was a lady who pulled out a gun in the photo department. I'm like, are you serious? Like, how much, how badly do you want to save $10 on a memory card? Like, I'm, I'm not trying to get shot out here trying to save $50 on a TV. Like, this is insane. This is crazy. It's wild. It's chaos. It's like on Thursday, we're thankful for what we have. On Friday, we're ready to trample, fight, and possibly shoot somebody to save 50 bucks. Like, it's madness. It's chaos. And that's the pattern of this world a lot of times. It's busy. It's on the go. It's constant. We got to do this. We got to do that. And busyness is almost worn like a badge of honor. You know, if you work 50, 60, 70 hours a week and you have no free time, then, you know, you're, you're seen as more successful or this is something that's like esteemed or something like that. And the result is we're always on the go. We're committing to do this. We're committing to do that. We're volunteering more on the weekend. Then we're, we're going to go back. We're going to get our master's. And it's just constantly on the go. Um, we're, we don't have joy. We're out of peace. And it seems like we're just overwhelmed by our emotions. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Just a little bit? Well, I did a bit of research. I found a, f a couple of very interesting surveys. The first one was by the American College Health Association. They surveyed 1,000 students in the spring of 2017. So the, the period is at some point during the last 12 months, they felt the following way. 87% felt overwhelmed. 51% felt hopeless. 84% felt exhausted, not from physical activity. 67% felt sad. 62% lonely. 61% overwhelming anxiety. 40% felt overwhelming anger. And 40% felt so depressed, it was hard to even function. And it just, it kills me to see these statistics. But it's not just college students either. There was another survey done by the American Psychological Association, and this is back from 2015, surveying adults 18 plus, and they found that 67% were stressed about money, 65% about work, 54% about family concerns, and 51% about health concerns. It's a lot of stress. Drink some water, de-stress. Um, so we also know that 
uh, stress, yes, it's painful mentally, but we know it also has real effects on our physical bodies. Um, that stress can cause heart disease, high blood pressure, autoimmune disease, sleeplessness, weight gain, is linked to diabetes, among other things. Um, a bunch more. So stress and anxiety, man, it's serious, and it takes a serious toll on our body. So that's the pattern of our society today, but that's not the way that God designed us to live. He didn't design us to live under constant stress and anxiety and kind of overwhelmed by our emotions. God's design is this. Jesus said in John 16, 33, I have told you these things so that in me you will have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And again in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, he said, Come to me, all you are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So God designed us to live in rest and peace, kind of regardless of the circumstance. And you might be saying, like, Tread, easier said than done. I'm like, I'm right there with you. Um, but at the same time, I want to talk about tonight a little bit how we can live in rest. We can live in peace. We can have joy. And we can kind of manage um, the emotional overload. All right? Now, I don't know how many note takers we have in the house. Anybody? We got a couple. Um, but if, uh, if something's speaking to you tonight, I want you to encourage you just to write it down. You know, this is something you could always go back to in the future, especially if there's a season where you're like, man, I wish I, you know, kind of, rem- you know, kind of had a couple of those points from that message I heard three months ago or something like that. It's good just to write it down. Also, um, I wanted to say three things quickly before we get into this. One is you're not a bad Christian, if there was such a thing, if you struggle with your emotions, you know, and if this is something that is serious for you and this is something that is really crippling your life, it's good to, to be in a group like Living Free. It's good to see um, a pastor or a counselor or a doctor or something like that. And it, it's important to, to not just ignore this or write it off as just emotional pain. Um, the second thing is anxiety and stress and emotional health, it's a complex topic. And there's no, I'm not going to give you any kind of five, you know, magic easy steps to overcome your, your emotions and never have to deal with them ever again or something like that. But I will say I believe that God's power and God's strength is greater than whatever we're facing. Do you guys believe that with me? So emotions are powerful, aren't they? I mean, they're a powerful thing. They're, most of the time, or a lot of the time, they can be amazing. They can be awesome when we experience happiness, joy, peace, pleasure, whatever it is. It's, it's something that is desirable. It's something that God made for us. And not that negative emotions are always bad, but when they start taking over our lives and they keep us from the good things that God has for us, um, we need to be aware of that. We need to figure out how we can manage that. So, because our emotions play such a big role on how we live our lives. They impact how we relate to other people. They impact the decisions that we make, how we see ourselves, and most importantly, how we, how we relate to God and how we see ourselves in our relationship with God. But what are emotions anyway, right? Where do they come from? Um, Dr. Aaron Beck from the University of Pennsylvania postulated his theory of cognitive specificity in the 1970s. And it sounds complicated, but it's really not. It's just the theory that our emotions are created by our thoughts. So our emotions are a mirror of what we're thinking at any given time. You guys with me? Now, I'm not saying there aren't exceptions to this, but in general, I think we can all agree that our emotions are shaped by our thoughts. And in fact, this is one of the most tested theories over the last 40 years and has a tremendous amount of clinical and scientific support. So let's give a couple examples. So if you're feeling guilty, you might be, you might be thinking, you know, I shouldn't have done that. 
Um, I'm just, I'm a bad person. I keep doing this, you know, over and over again. Or maybe you're feeling lonely and you say something like, uh, you know what, no one really cares about me. You're not really, you know, when I need people the most, you know, they're not there for me. You know, I'm just a loner. Or if you're anxious, you might be saying, this isn't going to work out. Something bad is going to happen. I just know it. This always happens. Or when you're condemned, you feel like, man, God's so far from me. He can't keep forgiving me. I keep doing the same things over and over and over again. And maybe you feel worthless that, you know, I just, I'm never going to amount to anything and no one in my family has ever amounted to anything and I'm just going to be just like they are. And we say these things a lot of times. We don't, we're not even, we don't even realize it. It's kind of subconsciously there. We keep repeating these phrases over and over and over in our heads till we believe them. And it really impacts how we feel. Um, further, two people can experience the same exact thing but feel completely different about it. So, um, for example, um, I love all different genres of music, um, and I still like CDs. Anybody else like CDs? Yeah, they sound better, and I just like playing them in the car. There's some kind of like physical attachment when you, know, when you really like an artist or a band, you want to buy their CD. I don't know what it is, but I like CDs. So, I have a bunch in my car, and you know, one day I'm listening to like worship, you know, and I'm just going, and then, like, the next day, I'll be listening to, like, classical music, like Bach or Schubert or something. And then I'll listen to, like, electronic or rap. Shout out to Zabai. We got them prophets, yeah. Um, so, uh, but my favorite genre is probably metal, okay? Now, specifically, specifically Christian metal, Rob. And um, if you haven't been aware, that's been a thing for, like, 20 years at least. Um, so anyway, there was this one day I'm playing one of my favorite metal CDs in the car, uh, and my dad's with me, all right? And so the song starts out really soft for like the first three minutes, all right? And then all of a sudden, it's dead silence, all right? And then a huge breakdown comes in, like blaring guitars and drums and screaming vocals. And I'm like, yeah, like, let's go. I have all these feelings of passion and elation. And my dad, like, almost jumped out of the car like he saw a ghost. And he's like, what kind of Satan music is this? And I'm like, this is awesome. So I had feelings of, of excitement, of, of passion. He had feelings of, like, this is, this is panic, this is fear, this is weird, and possibly demonic. So we kind of had opposite uh, sets of emotions, and this was possible because of how we viewed, how we interpreted the music. I viewed the music as something positive, and obviously he did not. So the idea is, is that our emotions are shaped by our thoughts. And there's something called the cognitive process, and it's basically this, that we have certain beliefs, which is where we develop our thoughts, and then our thoughts shape our emotions, and our, sh and our emotions shape our experiences and the decisions that we make. So in Romans 12.2, it says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And I want you to focus on this word renew or renewing because it starts with the mind. It starts with a change in our thinking. And the Greek word for the word renewing is um, anachinosis. I had to make sure I got that right. Anachinosis, which means renovation, renewal, or complete change of mind. And this idea of changing your mind is, is really uh, popular in the Bible. It comes up several times. Another area, uh, or another word that's really key to this idea of changing a mind is the word repent, which comes from the Greek word metanoia. So we see this principle of changing our mind or changing our thinking. And I like how the New Living Translation reads. It says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. By changing the way that you think. So we need to change uh, the way we think from the pattern of this world to the way that God has designed. We need to set our focus on Christ and, and, and the truth of his word, and that will change us. And once we change the way that we think, 
it'll change the way that we feel. And so we need to move, next slide. Oh, maybe I missed it. But anyway, so the pattern of this world is hurried, right? It's chaotic. It's being led by our emotions. But the way that God has designed is one of rest and peace. Also, there's a lot of interesting scientific research and studies on this topic. Um, in the past, you know, it was thought in the field of neuroscience that our brains were rigid, that it didn't change much after childhood. But after a host of new developments over the last decade or so, we now know that's not true. We know that our brain is adaptable, it's moldable, it's kind of like plastic. And so that's why you may have heard of this term neuroplasticity, right? the brain games, all that stuff. But we've seen and it's been shown that you can change the, your brain's structure and form by changing the way that you think. It's, it's incredible. And when I first heard that, I was like, dude, we can change the way our, like, our brains by the way we think. Like, that's, that's awesome. Like, it's wild. So we have like 100 billion neurons in our brain. And one neuron will send electrical impulse to another neuron, firing down, crossing over the synapse, and they form this pathway, right, called a neural pathway or neural connection. The more that you think about something or you learn a skill or you react a certain way, the more defined and solidified these pathways become. So you can think of it like this. So um, say you're like walking like um, I don't know, you're walking in some woods near your house and you're taking the path that's definitely been there for a while. Most people, they walk down this path. It's impressed in the ground. The brush has moved out of the way. You can see there's a clear path here. Now, say you decided to go off that path and walk through the brush. Well, the first time you did that, you wouldn't really make much of a path. But if you kept taking that route every single day for the next several months, it would become a defined pathway. And it's a very similar process in the mind. So the more we think about something, the stronger the pathway will become. Now, how many people have been to Boston? All right. Now, how many people have driven in Boston? So um, New York, it's, it's annoying to drive in New York, but it's a nightmare driving in Boston. All right? So up here, you'll see, like, the way that New York is set up, at least it makes sense. Like, there's a grid. It has, like, the numbers east, west. I, it just, it makes sense driving there. You go to Boston, it's just a mess. And the Yankees are better than the Red Sox. I'm just throwing it out there. All right. So, <laughs> anyways, um, if we are constantly being led by our negative self-talk and we are being led by our emotions, our neural pathways might look a little bit more like Boston than New York. All right? So let me give a couple little examples about how this works. So say you have a difficult situation that pops up at work, something happens, and you always respond with like being angry and you say things like, you know, my boss, you know, he's such a jerk and like I shouldn't have to deal with this kind of stuff, like this is, this is ridiculous and I can't do this, and you start stressing yourself out, you become accustomed to doing that every single time you get in that type of situation. Or when you're offended, if you're just gonna respond back in anger and, and you kind of lash out at people, again, it becomes ingrained in your brain. Or another example, you know, check this one out. Every time you sin, you kind of run from God. You, you're just like, you know what? He doesn't want to talk to me right now. I told him I would never do this again, and I did it again. And you kind of just do that every time it becomes ingrained in your brain. But the good news is we can rewire our neural pathways. So the question really becomes, how do we have this changing of mind? How do we have this renewing of mind? What does that actually look like? How do we do that? Well, the first thing you might say is obvious, but the first thing is turning to God in prayer. And that's clearly like the most Christian answer, right? But I bet you, if you're honest with yourself, the first thing you do when you're stressed or overwhelmed isn't pray a lot of times. Maybe it's not even in the top five. I know sometimes I struggle with this too, but what God is saying is he wants us to come to him right when we're struggling and saying, God, you know what, I'm feeling overwhelmed right now. I'm feeling angry or, God, I'm feeling worthless. This is, this is what's going on right now. God, I'm praying for your peace. I'm praying for your supernatural joy, God. Um, I, I just, I need you right now. And that'll really uh, help things change. 
The second thing is replacing negative self-talk with God's word, with the truth. So the first thing you can do is make a list of scripture verses um, that really speak to the area or areas that you struggle in. So if it's about hopelessness or um, your value, you can begin to just make a list of scripture verses that have to speak on that. And one thing I like to do, too, is I just have a list of them on my phone. And if I ever, like, need to pray or something, I just pull up the list right on my phone. I also like to make um, my, uh, my iPhone um, home screen wallpaper, you know, a verse or a quote or something like that that will just remind me throughout the day as I'm using my phone. The next thing, and this is super cool, all right? This might seem weird, but I really like it. All right, so the next thing is a written exercise. And... Um, I should have the steps up there, and three, two, one, no. Maybe it's not working, I don't know. But the written exercise one will be up there in a second. So the next time that you're feeling stressed or overwhelmed, I want you to ask yourself, what am I feeling right now? All right, still not up there. Can we flip to the next slide, maybe? Thank you. Um, so... We write down what we're feeling in that moment. The next thing is I want you to figure out what were the thoughts that you just had been thinking when you were feeling that emotion. All right? So first we write down the feeling. Then we write down the thoughts that we were thinking. And this is good to become aware of it. Then the next thing is I want you to look up a scripture on Google, just type it in, that corresponds to that thought, that topic. Okay? Then you can easily point out the lie. So for example, if I'm feeling like, um, I'm hopeless, and I look up the scripture verse that says that God has given me a hope in the future, I can clearly point out that the lie is that I don't have hope. And then the new thought would be that God says that I have a hope in the future and that he supplies all of my needs and that surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And you begin to write out this new thought and you begin to train your brain to think this way, to think along the lines of the truth instead of these negative self-defeating beliefs. And I'll give you one other example that's personal to me, is um, for years, you know, I've, sometimes I would feel guilty or I'd feel condemnation because I felt like I would say these things to myself, I should follow God better, right? I, should, I, I, I shouldn't have these types of thoughts or I shouldn't do these types of things. And it even started when I was a teenager, really. I wanted to, I was like, you know, I'm going to get serious about following God. I want to stop sinning. So I started counting my sins every day. So I was just keeping track of my sins every day. And I was like, if I was under like 8 or 10, I'd be like, oh, that was a good day. You know what I mean? So like every day um, I would just count, you know, what was going on. And really this made me actually sin more because I was so focused on my sin and that I could never live up to my expectation. It kind of just created this cycle of I should be this, but I'm not. And I could never live up to that expectation. I could never live up to that, that standard of perfection. So the feeling would be guilty or condemned. The thought would be, I should be following God better. The scripture could be, um, he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we could be called the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Well, then I could point out the lie and say, you know what? It's not about my righteousness. It's about God. It's not about my works. It's about his. And my new thought would be is, I am free. I am redeemed. I am not judged by my past, but I am a new creation in him. And you know what? Every single lie or every single thought that doesn't line up with the truth of God, it's a lie. It's a lie from a wandering thought or it's a lie from the devil. And I'm telling you, if you do this, it's going to be forced at first. It's going to feel kind of weird. But sometimes you just got to will it until you feel it. Sometimes you just got to will it until you feel it. And I love what Martin Luther said. He goes, he said this, ready? He said, feelings come and go, but feelings are deceiving. My warrant is on the word of God and not else am I believing. So sometimes, yeah, clap it up for God right now. Let's do it. Sometimes you got to will it until you feel it. All right? Will it until you feel it. So that's number two. We got a few more. <laughs> the next is um, making a list of things that you're thankful for. And this seems so trivial, but the cool thing is we've actually seen scientifically this has positive effects on the brain. So if you're somebody that's, it's hard to get sleep at night because your mind is just going crazy, before you go to sleep, make a list of things that you're thankful for and the things that you're excited that God is doing in your life. 
and this could really help you kind of put your mind at ease so you could fall asleep. I think I saw another stat when I was researching too, it was like 40% of adults say that they're kept up from time to time at least by wandering thoughts. Another thing is uh, doing some active stuff, right? Exercising, dancing, whatever it is, this also has a lot of positive effects on our moods. So, you know, sometimes I come home, throw on a little social club misfits, do a little dance or something. You know, it just makes you feel better. If you don't believe me, try it. The goofier the dance, the better. All right, and then the last thing is, is super important. It's making sure you're not keeping this to yourself, making sure you're not keeping this, you know, wrapped inside. I'm not saying you gotta tell everybody about your business, please don't, keep it off of Facebook, but like, the thing is, you gotta have somebody. You need somebody to share your heart with, to share your mind with, and just pick somebody who's a trustworthy person, you know, and they'll be there for you, and it'll really help. I'm gonna call the band back up. You guys wanna pop back up? Um, so throughout the series, we've been talking about this analogy as God, as our head coach. And for me, it makes a lot of sense. Over the years, I played a lot of sports. I played tennis. Um, I ran cross country. I played soccer, baseball, and basketball. And I started playing basketball when I was around nine years old. And I played that for a long time. I played the, all the way through college. I played um, Division One basketball over at Robert Morris University. And so throughout that time, I had a lot of coaches. And the relationship between the players and the coaches, especially the head coach, is really important. The head coach is the one who kind of sets the tone. He's the one that makes the plans. He's the one that motivates the team. And if the players don't trust him and they don't, they don't follow his direction, the team is going to have a lot of chaos and they're not going to be a very successful team. And thinking about this concept, it reminded me of one of my favorite movies, Excuse me, it's a little bit of an older movie, but it's called Hoosiers. Has anyone seen that? I know Josh Faye's seen it, because um, it's from, it's about a high school basketball team in Indiana, and they're from a really tiny high school, um, and they get this new coach, Coach Norman Dale, and they don't trust him. There's a lot of fighting, they don't win games, people quit, it's kind of chaotic. But the team really comes together, they trust him, and they start winning games, and against all odds, they make it eventually to the state championship game of Indiana, and they win. Spoiler alert, the movie's been out for a long time. You should have seen it already. So, um, and they win the game. So we're going to watch a quick clip of one of the pregame speech for the semifinal game before the Hoosiers took the court. All right? You can see from the players' faces when they were in the locker room that they were afraid of this, this platform. They had never been there before, but they trusted the direction of their coach. And you could say they went from being like, panicky and fear, fearful to being like fired up and ready to take on the game. And uh, one other thing I want to share too is just, I had a couple opportunities um, when I was younger that my dad actually coached my soccer team and my basketball team. And that relationship was so much greater than just a coach-player relationship because he was my dad and we had that level of trust. And sometimes when a game wasn't going the right way or something was happening, um, you know, he would just say something to me like, dude, you can do this. Like, you got it. Like, I'm right here with you. You can do this. And it just made all the difference. So I like this analogy um, of a head coach. I think it's good. But it only goes so far because we're not talking about a game. We're not talking about, um, you know, a fallible human being as our coach. Man, we're talking about God who is the creator of the heavens and the earth. Man, he is the greatest conceivable being. He is all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-present. Man, there is no one like our God. He has never been defeated, and he never will. He is the undefeated God, and man, and we can trust in him. Man, he is our father, and he is a good father. And especially when we're going through something difficult and we feel overwhelmed, it's important just to lean in and just lean into his love and trust in him. Man, he will never fail you. He will never fail you. And when we lean into him, it's not something that we do where we're just trying harder, right? It's not about effort, but it's just about changing our mind. 
leaving the pattern of this world, this pattern of thinking behind us, and taking up God's thoughts for us, taking up the truth of God's words about us and about our life. You know what I'm saying? And it says in Philippians 4 that the peace of God, which passes all understanding, it passes every situation, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. And it's an amazing thing. It's a powerful thing. And so tonight, if you're here and you have never put your trust in Jesus, you've never made the decision to follow him, um, I just want to give you an opportunity right now. Because God loves you so much that he would, he would rather die than be without you. And that's exactly what he did. He came and he lived the perfect life that we couldn't. He took our place and he made a way so that we could be forgiven and be in relationship with him again. So let's just close our eyes and bow our heads real quick. And if you're out there and you're saying, Tread, I want to make a decision to follow Jesus today. Just as a declaration of your faith, man, just a, that first kind of step, I want you to just go ahead and raise your hand right now. If you're saying, I want to follow Jesus with my life, go ahead and raise your hand right now. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray together. God, I give you my life. I put my trust in you. Forgive me of my sin. I make you my God. I'm going to follow you for the rest of my days. In Jesus' name, amen. Also, I just want to pray for everybody here tonight. I don't know what you've been struggling with or what parts of life have been overwhelming for you. And again, I'm telling you, this is not just some rah, rah, rah positivity stuff. The power of God is real, and it is strong, and it is greater than whatever we're facing. So I just want to pray right now for you. Just go ahead and relax in your seat. Take a deep breath. And God, I just pray for everyone here that they receive your rest right now. They receive your peace, God. I pray whatever's been keeping them bound, whatever's been holding them back, God, I pray that it would just be broken right now in Jesus' name. I thank you for freedom of mind right now. In Jesus' name. God, I thank you by your Holy Spirit that you would just comfort them. And I would just say, talk to God right now. Tell him what's been holding you back. Just give it to him. Give it to him right now. He's with you right where you are, and he promises that he'll never leave you, that he'll never forsake you. God, we thank you for your perfect peace surrounding us. And I'm just closing with Psalm 91. It says, when we call upon him, he will answer us, and he hears us, and he prolongs our days, and, and he rescues us from trouble and delivers us. And God, we thank you for that. In the name of Jesus, amen.